15, it says, uh, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that's what we're here to do today. So let's start with a prayer. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Father, I thank you for the blessing of being able to come today and to worship you and to be in your house. Uh, so, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and fill us anew today. Uh, lead us in our worship. Help us to hear your voice and help us to give you the best of our hearts and our minds and our voice as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's continue on in an attitude of prayer as we uh, begin our prelude. Beautiful. You guys sound great today. That's wonderful. I love hearing the voices of God's people lifted up in his, his worship. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Yesterday we had an amazing vacation Bible school. Um, it was just wonderful. We had uh, a, a lot of kids and they uh, enjoyed themselves. And um, uh, next week we're going to have a video that, that will show some of the things. Uh, that happened. Uh, the one thing that you won't get to see is I had to show a bunch of guys, little, little, little guys, how to eat a cupcake. <laughs> and to show them that it is possible to take the entire cupcake and put in your mouth at one time. <laughs> had a great time. I was, I was sticky, I mean, but... Um, if you participated in VBS, or if you sent a kid to VBS, or if you're any way you prayed for VBS, I want you to stand so we can recognize you and, and, and just, um, come on guys, it's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. See, we're, 
we're breaking new ground. I mean, the first day we found we can speak in church. We can say amen. We've raised our hands. We've stood in church. I mean, golly, we're just moving along. Um, and then uh, come some of the things that are happening this week, uh, Wednesday the 27th at 7 o'clock, is that Grace Chapel vision uh, meeting that I wanted to have. Uh, you know, I've spent the last two weeks, I've, I've visited a lot of people. Not, I mean, I've still got a lot more to visit. But uh, I, I've gone and talked to a lot of people. And um, here's what I've noticed. We're tired. Um, the church is tired. Um, the church universal is tired. I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been rough. Um, and a lot of what I keep hearing over and over and over again is we're just too old. And our community is too old. And, you know, it's like we, we have nothing that we can do other than just sit here and wait for the, the shut the doors on us. And let me just tell you, that's not true. Uh, there, I have access to a program that the, the conference gives us that shows us the demographics. And I just want to let you know that uh, sitting within three miles, or within three miles of where you are sitting right now, there are 9,000 people, over 9,000. 9,000 people within three miles of where we are right now. Anybody know the average age of those 9,000? If I've told you, don't give away the secret. What do you think? The average age. Let's say 68. Who would say 68? 58? Got any 58s? Come on, we can raise our hand. 48s? Who? What? 38. 9,000 people within three miles of, of, yeah, within three miles of where we're sitting with the average age of 38 years old and a huge population of children between the ages of 5 and 17. Um, we have a lot of hope. This church has a lot to offer. Um, I've seen that just in the, the couple of weeks I've been here. And let me tell you, uh, if, if we want to take pride in our church, and if we want to take pride in our God, um, we can really make a difference. And, and I, have, I have been to all the church planting trainings and this and that. I mean, I, 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 now God does it, but, but I know some ways that we can do this. But we have to want to do it. And, and that's partially what this vision meeting is about. Uh, each of you has a passion for something, uh, something God lays on your heart. And so we just want to try to, to come and get a vision kind of going and, and get us a direction and get us some momentum and get us moving. And you will be surprised at what you will see happen here. Um, so, so anyway, I, I bunny trout. I didn't. I don't. I don't talk this much normally, but my first couple of weeks here, I guess. I, I guess I do. Uh, and you also see there's a, a widow's breakfast on Monday, August the first. I'm not sure what that is, but I guess it's breakfast for widows. Um, if you would like to be a part of that, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, then Wednesday, August the third, if I could uh, kind of get with the worship team. Uh, you know, everybody ushers, guys upstairs, uh, uh, let's talk about how we can do worship as, as well as we possibly can. And I want to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, and then a church council meeting on Thursday, August the 11th. So those are all in your bulletin. Uh, let's see, I think that's everything. Okay, let's continue our worship with our tithes and offerings.
and thou fount of every blessing. get too comfortable though because I'm going to need you to be standing here in just a second. Um, we are going to um, dedicate our, uh, the, the, the prayer shawls uh, in just a second and uh, I'm going to invite you to come forward and um, actually put your hands up on that. If, if you want to you know, maintain your social distancing and you're not comfortable coming up, uh, then feel free to just you know, stay in your pews and you can just kind of kind of lift a hand towards this way. I wanted to read something to you. This is in, in Acts 19. Well, it's supposed to be in Acts 19. Anyway, what it says in Acts 19 is that any clothing, a piece of cloth or handkerchief, I think it actually says, that touched Paul, uh, they would take pieces of Paul's clothing and would take it to uh, the sick and there would be healed and uh, those that were afflicted with demons uh, would be would be outcast from Paul, so there is something uh, true and beautiful about the imparting of the Holy Spirit into a cloth or an object that that is then taken to somebody else. Uh, if you're there and you go, gee, I know somebody that needs a prayer cloth. Um, th th there is there. Please come get one. Uh, there's a book in the back back here uh, that you just kind of sign out. You know how many you took and where you took them uh, but but they are I've seen it I've seen it do a lot of wonderful things so if you'd like to come forward and, and, and come navigate the stairs be careful let's come here and, and see if you can put your hands on this if you feel comfortable doing that um, if you want to just leave me up here hanging by myself then um, you know not to, to guilt you into it but. kids up, I tell you what, the power of a, of a prayer of a child is, is, um, is amazing.
Father, we thank you for the blessing of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your Spirit is here with us, that your Spirit travels with us, uh, that your Spirit will guide us and speak to us and, and lead us. Uh, but Father, we also pray for the healing that your Spirit brings. And so we, we claim your promise that where two or more are gathered together, it will move your hand. And so uh, the full weight of Grace Chapel is, is here, and we uh, are laying our hands upon these uh, prayer cloths in complete confidence that you will bless them and that your spirit will be present in them and then as they go forth into the world that uh, people will experience you um, in strong and amazing and powerful ways and we just thank you for that Father. we thank you for the results that will happen even before we see it we ask all this in jesus name amen, amen. amen. Just, just be careful heading back down the stairs So um, now we're kind of we're kind of talking prayer anyway. Do we have um, we have any prayer requests we'd like to bring forward today? Yes. Amen. Amen. Any others? Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I have one. Uh, the fireman had a, a pretty tough call the other night. I don't know her name. Ronnie didn't make it. Just right quick. She tripped and spilled a hot of boiling oil on her. Her face was burnt 40% of her body. So. And I have a joy. Uh, 35 years ago tomorrow, <laughs> I married the bravest woman on the planet. <laughs> I do think in this church and right in that pew right there, right, me right there, we stood there and, and said our vows. We stuck to pretty good together all through all that time. And uh, I just thank her for her perseverance. And I thank her mostly for her love. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Was there? Yes. Amen. Wow. wow. That's wonderful. Ray, Ray and I have a joy. Uh, our youngest son, Andrew, was named head boys varsity basketball coach at Kings Mountain High School on Friday. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. Um, God is present, God is active in our lives. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, here's the new guy of three weeks going, that's great that all these new faces, but <laughs> I guess I'm the new face. Any others? Okay, let's take these and any unspoken we have to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, I just thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. I thank you for uh, this community of faith that you have created here. And Father, we just, uh, we just lift up these names and these faces and uh, situations and, and everything that uh, is laying upon our hearts. Uh, we put them in your hands. Uh, Father, we pray and we thank you for the joys and the blessings that you bring into our lives because they are so numerous. Uh, and sometimes we even miss them. Uh, but Father, as we, we place uh, these friends and family uh, in your care, uh, we do so with great confidence 
uh, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you care and you love for each and every person that we pray for. Uh, and we know that you will respond in a way that is perfect in your sight. Uh, so we thank you for that. Uh, Father, we thank you for um, all the volunteers that came and worked in Vacation Bible School yesterday. We pray for all the kids and the families that were represented. Um, it was just a wonderful time, and, and you were there. Uh, you were in our midst. We thank you for that. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for our church, and we pray for our community. Uh, you're not finished with Grace Chapel yet. Uh, you have great plans uh, for this church, this body of people. Uh, and so, Father, we seek your guidance. We seek your spirit. Uh, we seek your leading to show us uh, just what it is you want us to do. Uh, and we pray that you will send your spirit out into our community uh, to begin to touch the hearts of those that are hurting or broken or worried or hungry, whatever it is, Father. Uh, go out there and prepare the ground for us. Uh, and then send us, Father. Send us, e even though it's scary, even though we're embarrassed, even though we're shy, uh, we might be too old or too young or too ugly or too whatever, Father, send us anyway, because uh, you use broken people to make great miracles happen. Uh, we pray for our country. Uh, we pray that you will just go and, and send your spirit and just settle all the unrest, all the division. Uh, Father, let, let your will reign in our country again. And we ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, as we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Y'all happy to be here? Yes. Everybody still awake? Okay. Hang on. Uh, so, you know, we've been hanging out in Luke chapter 15 uh, for a couple of weeks now. Well, actually just one week. This is our second week. Uh, we, we are uh, we're living in a, a difficult time. We really are with COVID and the economy, and uh, sometimes it's easy for us to just, just feel lost. Because uh, I know I have. I've felt lost before. And, and Luke 15 is one of those chapters that will help us. Oh, yeah, that's right. Doggone it. You've got to remind me of these things. We, we will let our uh, kids go to children's church. I'm trainable. I am trainable. Uh, just takes a while. Uh, but Luke 15 is one of those chapters that will help us recenter ourselves. Uh, on the things that are really important, and that being the love um, that an all-powerful, um, all-knowing, all-present uh, God has for each of us, uh, because that's what really matters. Uh, Luke 15 is a series of parables that Jesus told. There's three of them to be exact. Um, each parable uh, is about things that are lost uh, and things that are found. And last week, if you remember, we learned that heaven throws a party when something, uh, more, more likely someone, uh, is moved from the lost category to the found category. Uh, when we make the decision to say yes to Jesus, all of heaven rejoices. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's amazing to think our decisions here on earth uh, affect the happiness of heaven. Uh, we, we actually change the joy of heaven uh, through our decisions. And so today we're going to get a little bit more personal. Um, it, it's, it's great to think that heaven throws a party when one of us says yes to, to Jesus. But today I want to look specifically at the reaction of our Father himself. Um, how does God react when one of his children returns home? Um, it's it's one of my favorite parables, and, and I'm, I know probably a lot of you already know it. It might be your favorite parable, too. Uh, we like to call it the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and it is actually that parable that inspired uh, John Newton to write his famous hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Uh, that's, that's where he got that from. Uh, now, like I said, we, we call this the parable of the prodigal son. 
Uh, but in reality, it, it has nothing to do with the Son. It has everything to do with the Father. Uh, what Jesus is trying to do is answer the age-old question, uh, what is God like? And, and how does God react when one sinner returns? Um, ultimately, the, the foundational message of this parable is God loves you. God has always loved you, uh, and God will always love you. So we're going to kind of walk through this parable. We're going to go verse by verse, starting in uh, verse 11. It says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. Uh, why did the younger son leave? I mean, I, I'm sure this kid had all the comforts of a, uh, that a family of wealth could provide. The, uh, the, the other younger kids in town, they were saying, Boy, I'd love to have what he has. So why did he leave? He, he, had, he had everything he needed, uh, but he didn't have everything he wanted. Uh, he, he, he wanted more, more freedom, fewer rules. Uh, the story begins with the youngest son coming to the father, uh, who represents God, um, and decides that he no longer wants to be under the authority of his father. And so he says to his dad, I, I want my inheritance and I want it now. No explanation, no justification, no thank you, uh, no, no nothing. Uh, the boy just wants what he wants, and he wants it now. Um, now, the original hearers of this story that Jesus was talking to, uh, and, and, and they are listening through a, a certain cultural lens uh, that I don't want us to miss with this parable. Uh, because there's a, there's a lot about this story uh, that would have left them actually scratching their heads, actually angry. Uh, the request that the young son made was, was disrespectful. Um, and it was extremely hurtful to the father. Um, it was unheard of in that culture. Because ultimately what this young kid is saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want my freedom. I, I want out of this family. Now give me my inheritance now and I'm out of here. I wish you were dead. Uh, and, and this request, uh, or, or really the, the granting of this request, uh, would have made the father look like a fool to everyone uh, that knew him. Uh, in fact, uh, according to Old Testament teachings, uh, a father who received such a request from a son uh, would have had the son taken out and stoned. That, that was what the normal response should have been. Uh, but, but let's look at what the father did in, in verse 12. It says, so he divided his property between them. The father gave the young son what he wanted. That means you know, the father had to sell some property in order to give the son his part of the inheritance. This, this was embarrassing. Um, he, he had to put the farm on the market in order to give the son what he wanted. Uh, but, but doesn't... Doesn't God do the same with us? I mean, he, he allows us to, to break the rules. He allows us to, to break our promises. He allows us to break our vows. He allows us to break his heart. The father, he, he just absorbs the pain of the son's rejection. Um, his heart is broken, but he loves his son. He always has, and he always will. So he, he lets him go. And we know that our Heavenly Father uh, is often wounded by our reaction as well. But, but neither the father of the prodigal uh, nor our father in heaven ever stops loving us. That's the beauty of it. Uh, you may be here today thinking that you have sinned away your place in God's heart. Uh, well, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you can't do that. It's impossible. No matter what you have done, no matter how far you have walked away from him, God loves you. He always has. He always will. Um, even when you've wounded his heart, he allows us to step out on, on the, the path of stupidity that I've done a lot of miles on. Uh, you know, to, to do, the, the, do it the way that seems right to us, but it ends in really in death and destruction. Uh, so the father watches his son take 
the wrong path. He allows it to happen, just as God does. And then look at this in verse 13. It says, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off to a distant country. He didn't waste any time. He gathered his things together and he journeyed to a far country. And notice, uh, it's, it's not just a geographical uh, notation. Uh, far country, it, it represents distance from God, distance from the Father. Both moral and, and spiritual distance. And then verse 13 continues, it says, And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. The young boy walks away from home uh, with his pockets full of money, determined to live it up in the faraway city, uh, surrounded by friends who are more than happy to help him spend his money. So he buys them drinks and women, and they party. And before long, all of the money is gone. And that's not the only problem that the young man is about to face. Because verse 14 says, When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he, he's in the far country. Uh, no longer does anyone care about who he is. Uh, they, they aren't coming to his parties anymore because he doesn't have enough money to have parties. Uh, the, the money is gone, the food is gone, the friends are gone. And he is now in severe need. So the boy thinks, what can I do now to get out of this situation? You see, he's, he's a schemer like us. He, he's a schemer. He's always thinking, how can I better myself? How can I improve my situation? How can I fix what is wrong? We see this from the very start when he decides to, to trample the father and asks for his inheritance. He's, he's scheming. And he's about to try another scheme. Verse 15, it says, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. Um, he's, he's living among the Gentiles now, starving. And the problem is, you know, feeding Gentile pigs uh, doesn't seem to pay very well. So we, we need to understand kind of what's going on in the story here. The, the young man is trying to, to figure out some way to earn his way back uh, to earn the money back so he can go back and be part of the family again. Um, he, he wants to, to re-earn that inheritance that he lost. So he hires himself out to a Gentile farmer. And, and just imagine the disgrace um, of a Jewish boy uh, working as a pig slop for Gentiles. Uh, but then in verse 16 it says, He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. So, he, he obviously isn't even making enough money for food, uh, much less to earn back his inheritance. So he begins to think. He begins to realize that, that his first scheme didn't work very well. Uh, he, he burned through his money in no time at all. Then the second scheme isn't working very well. Feeding pigs wasn't getting him anywhere. <coughs> so he now comes up with a third scheme. He's now going to try to come home. In verse 17 and 19 it says, When he had come to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. You know, he's, he's thinking... Uh, a lot better uh, than what he, he, he he's thinking he has what he can get at his father's is better than what he has right now uh, and so here's the deal you know I, I have I, I've always thought that the turning point of this story that moment of the prodigal's greatest misery uh, when he is broke and he's hungry um, in that moment that he repented I mean, isn't that how this parable is taught just so often? You hear it that way. Um, he, he's off in a far country. He's at his lowest point. He realizes the folly of his ways. He drops to his knees. He says the sinner's prayer. Doves fly. A heavenly light descends down upon him through the clouds. But, but is that what it really says? Is there anything in the text about him being sorry for what he has done? Does he, 
He, he even once acknowledged the fact that he's broken his father's heart. You know, is there one shred of evidence in this story that the prodigal repented while he's in the far country? There's not. What, what, what it does say is that he, he tried to find another way out of the mess that he'd gotten himself into. You know, he, he does what we do. He tries to fix it. Another scheme. He, he tries to find another way to get out of the mess that he's gotten himself into. You know, w without ever having to admit that he's failed. We've all done that. I've done that. Um, you know, we find ourselves in a mess, and instead of, of really facing that we've sinned, and we're out of fellowship with God, we, we try to, to, to climb back up to God by our own efforts. He hasn't repented. He's just finding another way to get out of the mess that he's created. Uh, go back and read it. Go back and read it. You'll see that. So, 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 so how about going to work as a servant for his father? You know, he's thinking, I'll go home. Um, I'll hire on as a per diem kind of guy. I'll work in the fields. And when I have enough money, I'll come I'll come home and make an appeal to, to my father to be reinstated in the family. He's even come up with a script that he's going to say when he meets the father. You know, working for the pig farm didn't work out. Let's try plan B. So, you know, we, we often think that he comes home with his, his head bowed, but he does not. He's not ready for grace. He, he's not ready to be found. You know, he, he's still executing his own plan. He's still lost. So here's the deal, and, and this is critical. This is so critical. If the prodigal son is able to find his own way back into the good graces of his father, due to his own ingenuity, the whole point of this parable is gone. If the son is able to find his own way back into the good graces of the father, the point of the whole parable is gone. The, the, the entire message Jesus is trying to tell tell us uh, it's it's lost if the prodigal can find himself you know we, we have to remember the lost son can no more find himself than the lost sheep could find himself or the lost coin could find itself in the previous two parables the lost coin cannot find themselves the lost sheep the lost cannot find themselves they must be found Look again at verse 18 and 19. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, see here's he's rehearsing, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So you see what he's doing? He's, he's rehearsing. He's rehearsing what he's going to say. He's practicing the lines uh, he needs to tell the father in order to put plan B into motion. Uh, there's no repentance here. There's only scheming. You know, this, this parable, you cannot read this parable any other way. But, but notice what happens in verse 20 and 21. Here's the payoff. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Uh, I, I have run this scenario over in my mind over and over and over again. I can see it as if I was there watching it happen. And I just wonder, you know, after the son received his inheritance and left the farm, uh, how long did the father stand in the doorway uh, watching his son leave? I, I wonder, after he left, how long did he stand there I wonder how many times did the father walk down the path in front of their home, maybe kind of looking off at the horizon, and just looking to see if, if maybe he would see that familiar stride of his son, the stride that he knows so well. I, I wonder how many times did the father wake up in the middle of the night with his son's name on his lips and in his heart? Because you know he did. You know, your father did. My father did. Our Heavenly Father does. That's what fathers do. So, you know, the, the father is, is standing in the place that he stood many, many times, and he's scanning the horizon. <clears throat> but this time he, he sees something. 
He sees a person, uh, and, and this person looks like a mess. He's tired and he's dirty. He's got you know, bags of rags hung over his shoulder. Probably a full-grown, scraggly beard. His, his hair is not combed. Uh, but there's, there's just there's something in the way that this figure walks. You know, the way that he moves. And the father recognizes him. Now, notice what happens next in verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The father races out to see his son because he was filled with compassion. And, and remember who the father is, the story, it's, it's God. Uh, now, when I read this parable, uh, I, I kind of get mad at the prodigal son. I don't know if you do too. I, I get kind of upset with him. H how could he do this uh, to his father? You know, how could he be so cruel and so cold? How could he be so selfish? Uh, and and I, I find myself writing this guy off. Get. But God doesn't. God once looked out over an entire city of people who did the same thing. And what was his reaction? He wept for them. Matthew chapter 23 Verse 37 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. So don't, don't miss the picture here. Don't miss the, 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 the passion of God. He knows that his children were, were not meant for the pigsty. We choose it. We choose the pigsty. We, we linger at the pig trough. We, we linger at the, that, that internet site. We let our anger get the best of us. We, we let our, our passions wreck our families. But deep down, you know, we, we, we long for home. Uh, we, we just long for home. We, we, we long for the Father to run to us, to throw his arms around us and to, to welcome us back home. Now, here's the deal. Here's where things get really interesting. Um, this is where the, the real meaning of what Jesus is trying to say uh, starts to come through. In Middle Eastern culture, uh, a man of his father's reputation and character and wealth and status would never run anywhere. They always they walked at a slow, dignified pace. Because if he were to run... He would have to, 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 to hitch up his tunic so he would not trip. And if he did this, it would show his legs. And in that culture, it was humiliating and shameful for a man of his stature to bare his legs. But, but all of this, the, the father's dignity, it, it was lost uh, in his love for his lost son. He pulls up his robes, exposing his skinny, knobby knees, and he ran out to find this boy that had been lost. And the Bible says that when he got there, he threw his arms around the boy and lavished him with kisses. And, and the tense of the Greek word used for kiss, it is a tense that means it, it wasn't just one kiss. The tense used here is uh, he is kissing him over and over and over and over again. This wasn't just one kiss. This was a continuous kissing of his son. And, and it was at that point that the, father, that the boy said, Father, I have sinned and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice what happens first. The Bible says that the father began to embrace him, to, to continue to kiss him, to love him. And then the son says his rehearsed lines. Father, I have sinned. You know, he, he makes his confession. Notice, the father does not uh, demonstrate love in response to the son's confession. That's not the way the, the story reads. Rather, before the son can say his lines, before any confession can be heard, the father pours out his love for his son. 
Uh, the, the text said he showered him with kisses. And in the midst of all this, when the son is, is finally able to maybe speak, then he says, Father, I have sinned. And, and notice there's no reprimand. Just a bunch of hugs and a lot of kisses. You, know, you, you want to know what excites the heart of God? It's when the prodigal comes home. That's, that's what excites the heart of God. Here's a bit of trivia. This is the only time in the Bible that we can find in Scripture where God runs. Uh, and he, he still does the same thing today. God still runs. Um, God still runs when the, the addict pushes away the bottle. <coughs> when he pushes away the pills. Uh, the same thing happens today when the, the teenager walks away from the party that they, they knew they shouldn't have been at. The same thing happens today when the, the dad has the courage to push away from the desk when he's really called to work another 20 hours. He goes home and he spends time with his family. And the same thing happens when the atheist walks away from disbelief. The same thing happens every time the, the prodigal son or daughter comes home and a celebration breaks out. You, you, you need to understand that when it comes to salvation uh, or even restoration, God is the initiator. Has to be. It's never us. It cannot be us. It, the, the, it, it won't work. God is the initiator. God runs. Uh, we, we don't do some work and then God responds. Uh, but God pursues us until his overwhelming love is such that you know, we, we can't help but respond to it. That's, that's what happened to this young boy. It, it's, it's the love of the father, not the repentance of the son, that makes this story so unimaginable. The father had loved his son every day, every day that he was gone. And when the father saw him, he didn't want a confession. He just wanted to love him. And out of the love of the father came a true and honest confession of the son. And the Bible says that the father hadn't run out there to meet him all by himself. There was an entourage with him. Verse 22 says, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Well, you know, the best robe belonged to the father. Uh, you see, the, uh, the, the robe stood for honor. Um, it stood for acceptance. The father didn't just want the son to understand that, uh, you know, what was going on. The, the father wanted everyone to know. This is my son. He is honored in my house. He is accepted in my house. Yeah, yeah, I, I know all that other stuff. But this is now. And, and that's... So, so they get the father's purple robe the royal purple robe, and they place it on him. Why? He's back in the good graces. He's got standing with the Father. And then he says in verse 22, put a ring on his finger. And he's not talking about an, an ornamental ring like many of us wear today. It's, it's the signet ring used by the family to transact business. He's saying to the young man, I trust you again to be my son and to act on my behalf. And to the community, it says, he's got my authority. When he speaks, I'm speaking. And to a third servant, he says, put sandals on his feet. Because you know, in that culture, slaves didn't wear shoes. But the children of the family did. Um, and in one moment... Because of the pursuing grace of the father, this boy who had so violated his father's love was reinstated fully back in the family. So here he is. He's, he's dressed in his father's robe. He's wearing the authoritative ring. He's got shoes on his feet. And then the father told the servants, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. So they begin to celebrate. The fatted calf was the best uh, fed calf on the farm. And so they bring this fatted calf and they have a party. And, and let me tell you that you know, when you are away from God, when you come back, 
That's exactly what the Almighty God feels about you. He welcomes you back with the same exuberance as the Father in this story, saying, I love you. I have always loved you. I will never stop loving you. Welcome back into the fellowship of the family. And, and you know, so often in our churches, we, we want to make people jump through so many hoops that by the time they get through doing all the things that we've told them to do, they've decided that it's not worth it. I'm, I'm here to tell you, God's already done it. God's already done it. That's a good place for an amen. That's a good place for an amen. amen. Ooh, thank you. He's done everything necessary. It's simple. If you're away from him, he loves you. He's always loved you. He will never stop loving you. That's a good one, too. So I have a question for you. Do you know this kind of love? And would you be willing to listen closely to hear the steps of God running down the path to meet you? If you turn your ears towards heaven and if you turn in God's direction, here's what you're going to hear. Quick, bring the best robe and put on him or her. Put a ring on his or her finger and sandals on his or her feet. Bring the fatty calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son or daughter of mine was dead and is alive again. He or she was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. So let the party begin. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I, I just, I so thank you uh, for the parables that Jesus told us. Uh, I thank you that the one who, who knows you best can tell us how you are so we can know you. I thank you that you are a father who runs, who no matter how we have wounded your heart, you are so quick to run, throw your arms around us, to, to kiss us, to reinstate us into the family. Father, if there are those today who are feeling lost, uh, who are feeling left out, uh, Father, I pray that they will feel the pull of your Holy Spirit and that they will know the love of you as you run to them. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Could you stand for our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, hymn number 378? That's amazing. We didn't plan that. There's no planning, but there we are. Perfect. God. <laughs> <laughs>
Jesus, the Holy Spirit was talking pretty clear, I could tell. We didn't talk about any of that. Amen. Oh, well, yeah. right. Praise God. Amen. And the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now.